Okay, we have. Okay, as we have a quorum of four members, uh, I now wish to call a meeting to order. I've received apologies from Deputy uh, Michael Fitzmaurice. At the outset, I remind members, staff, witnesses, and those in the public gallery to turn off their mobile phones. Uh, mobile phones interfere with the sound system and make it difficult for the parliamentary reporters to report the meeting, and also tele television and radio and the web streaming. So just to take a moment to check your mobile phones to turn them off. Um, I now wish to read some formal notices for the information of the witnesses. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the Chairman to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor char make charges against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. I also wish to advise that any submissions or opening statements or other documents that you have supplied to the committee will be published on the committee's website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not criticise nor, uh, criticise nor make charges against a person outside the houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. The committee is meeting today to discuss the matter of supporting communities and sustaining small rural businesses within the border region after Brexit. I would like to welcome the following witnesses to our committee from the Centre from for Cross-Border Studies, uh, Dr. Anthony Suarez, um, Deputy Director, the East Border Region, Pamela uh, Arthurs, uh, Chief Executive from Northern Ireland Local Government Association, Councillor Seamus Doyle, member of the NILGA Executive, and Lisa O'Kane, Programme Manager from the Rural Community Network, uh, Aidan Campbell, Policy and Public Affairs, and from the Irish Centre uh, the Central Border Area, Shane Campbell, Chief Executive. It is proposed that the opening statements and any other documents supplied by the witnesses to the committee be published on the committee's website after the meeting. Is that agreed? Yes. Agreed. This is a very appropriate time to consider the risks to the border region, particularly in terms of rural and community development. Two and a half years ago, after the decision of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. It is still not clear what Brexit actually means in practice. The withdrawal agreement and a political declaration may or may not be agreed by the United Kingdom Parliament. There are, there are basic scenarios in relation to Brexit, in my view. There will be a soft Brexit with a withdrawal agreement and a transition period. There will be a hard Brexit without a withdrawal agreement meaning that the UK will basically crash out of the EU or um, there will be no Brexit at all. I think there is no good Brexit, basically, um, so we're trying to get the best possible outcome for, for this island and, um, as a whole and the whole of the EU. An added difficulty today is that there is no functioning executive in, in Northern Ireland we should always remember that policies on one side of the border can have serious effects on the other side of the border. There have been successes. The, the Peace 4 programme, which funds actions that promote social and economic stability in Northern Ireland and the border region uh, of Ireland, uh, is co-funded by the EU and the Irish and UK governments. Uh, some 240 million will be invested by the EU, Ireland and the UK over the programme period. And when there is cooperation between both sides, both sides can benefit. A good example uh, was rural transport with the joint control of the Great Northern Railways in the 1950s by both governments, North and South. Later in the 1960s, the Northern Ireland government closed all cross-border railways uh, except the Dublin-Belfast line. Consequently, there are no railway lines in counties Donegal, Tyrone, Fermanagh, Cavan and Monaghan, and there is no railway line anywhere between Derry and, and Mullingar. The committee looks forward to enhanced cooperation at local and regional level. 
this committee is interested in hearing the views of representatives here today and, and how can we mitigate the risks to, to the border region and how we can enhance rural and community development. The Joint Committee looks forward to your uh, contribution to policy formation in the era, area of rural and community development in the border region. As the committee has agreed to publish your opening statements, perhaps you could focus on the main points and speak for three to five minutes. Uh, I suggest that members should limit their questions as well to between three and five minutes. Um, so I now call on Dr. Anthony Suarez, Deputy Director, Centre for Cross-Border Studies, to make your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. On behalf of the Centre for Cross-Border Studies, I would like to thank the Chairman and members of this committee for the invitation to meet with you on the subject of supporting communities and sustaining small rural business within the border region after Brexit. As the Chairman actually referred to, even as we rapidly approach the date on which the United Kingdom will officially leave the European Union, it's still unclear as to what the scale and nature of the impact will be on border communities and business. What's at stake here is not only the economic future of communities and small rural businesses in the border region. What's also at risk, if not properly mitigated for, is social cohesion within the border region after Brexit. However, Brexit will not alter the fact that the United Kingdom will remain a co-guarantor, along with Ireland, of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. This means that in terms of maintaining the conditions for North-South cooperation that will assist in supporting communities and small rural businesses in the border region post-Brexit, the UK government must not shirk that responsibility to a non-operational Northern Ireland Assembly or Executive. To fully support communities and small rural businesses in the border region post-Brexit, it's essential that EU funding for North-South and cross-border cooperation is secured for the next programming period. However, we at the Centre for Cross-Border Studies are concerned that although the European Commission's fact sheet on the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland in the withdrawal agreement refers to the continuation of peace and interreg for Northern Ireland and the border regions of Ireland beyond 2020 under a single programme, Peace Plus, the political declaration on future UK-EU relations refers simply to the UK and EU's shared commitment to delivering a future Peace Plus programme to sustain work on reconciliation and a shared future in Northern Ireland. There is no reference here to the border counties of Ireland. Therefore, it's of paramount importance that legal guarantees are given that any future Peace Plus programme will encompass the border counties of Ireland and will be a significant contribution of at least 15% of any total budget to cross-border cooperation. Given the potential of the current leader programme to support cross-border cooperation activities in relation to rural development, it's also important that a similar support is provided in the post-Brexit context, either as part of any proposed Peace Plus programme or as a discrete programme supportive of rural development as one of the areas of North-South cooperation identified as part of the North-South cooperation mapping exercise. These are only some of the very headline issues in relation to supporting communities and small rural businesses in the border region following the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. Many imponderables still exist due to the unstable political landscape in Westminster, meaning that we can't be sure of the kind of Brexit we will be left with or whether we will have any Brexit at all. Whatever the case, I can assure the committee that the Centre for Cross-Border Studies will remain committed to supporting, promoting and advocating for cross-border cooperation as part of the ongoing process of peace and reconciliation and as a means of providing practical benefits to communities and businesses on both sides of the border. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I now call on... Um, Pamela Arthurs, please. Thank you, Chairman. 
In the first instance, again, might I thank the Chairman and the members of the Committee for inviting me here today to discuss the theme supporting communities and sustaining small rural business within the border region after Brexit. And with me today is my Chairman, Councillor Aidan Campbell from Monaghan County Council, my Vice Chairman, Alderman Hatch from Armagh Bambridge, uh, Craig Avon as well. Um, so let me first briefly explain the organisation. East Border Region is a local authority-led cross-border organisation and it's one of the few <coughs> genuinely cross-border organisations on the island of Ireland. Three local authorities in Ireland, Louth, Monaghan and Meath County Council and three in Northern Ireland, um, Newry Morn Down, Armagh Bambridge, Craig Avon and Ard North Down. So basically the east coast um, between Dublin and Belfast is covered by the cross-border organisation. The mission statement is simple but comprehensive to promote cross-border economic development which benefits the people of the region. Formed in 1976, East Border Region is one of the oldest genuinely cross-border organisations but we've always worked under the backdrop of the European Union. The initial impetus for cooperation, and again it was the first of uh, these organisations, it came from locally elected politicians on both sides of the border, and they realised that working together there would be mutual benefit. They realised that, if you can think back to the hostile political climate at that time, but they saw merit in working together. But it was only with the introduction of the EU Interreg programme in 1990 that really we made a difference. It was money for cross-border cooperation. So EBR has drawn down millions of euro alongside with our colleague organisations for a host of projects which have benefited communities and small rural businesses along the border corridor. And let's be honest, the majority of the border corridor is rural. Um, I have a brochure here which currently outlines uh, the scope of the work at the minute and there's over 91 million in terms of the uh, projects that we would be working on. Again, all genuine cross-border uh, projects funded through the Interreg programme, working on both sides of the border. Um, I just mentioned one which is the Co-Innovate programme funded by the Interreg programme. Intertrade Ireland leads a strategic uh, SME project that will complete in 2022. And the aim of Co-Innovate is to assist 1,409 small businesses in the border region and the west coast of Scotland. We all know the border region is dominated by small rural businesses, in particular micro-businesses less than 10 employees. These require the assistance not only to create new jobs, that's important, but it's very important to sustain the existing jobs. There is no doubt that the myriad of EU-funded projects which have been drawn down have significantly contributed to the growth of border business over the past 25 years, but there's still work to be done. Brexit will be a game-changer. What Brexit has done already is to highlight many needs which already exist in the border, as well as causing problems in the future. Small rural businesses have already been affected particularly in, um, here in Ireland. The drastic fall in sterling after the referendum, the ongoing uncertainty around Brexit, which has dominated our landscape since the vote in June 2016, is not good for business. Couple this with the lack of a government in Northern Ireland, and border businesses are certainly suffering. Whilst the Irish government has put in place measures to support rural business, the same opportunities do not exist in Northern Ireland. So what has been the local authority response to Brexit? Particularly with the absence of the government in Northern Ireland, the local authorities along the border felt it necessary to articulate and to lobby for the needs of the one million constituents of the border region. Brexit and the border card on the island of Ireland, risks, opportunities, issues to consider, was commissioned by the 11 local authorities. Um, we in East Border Region facilitated that report. Again, I have a copy of it, and copies can be made available to members of the committee. Um, this report clearly identified that the economy of the Border Region currently lags behind the economies of both Ireland and Northern Ireland. It also outlines that the border will be most detrimentally affected as a result of Brexit, 
and that regional disparities do exist along the border. Areas most reliant on agriculture will suffer most. Also note, some farmers in Northern Ireland receive 87% single farm payment. They're actually currently better off due to the fall in sterling because they receive their monies in euro. But where will this money come from in the future? Some of the groups represented here today responded to a consultation around a future possible UK prosperity fund, came from Westminster, um, where this was to um, uh, compensate for the lack of EU funding. Despite our efforts, the report hardly recognised the need to fund any cross-border activity. Dan O'Brien, the chief economist um, in the IIEA, stated at a Brexit event in Dublin on the 4th of December that whilst employment growth overall in Ireland is good, employment in the border region has faltered since June 2016. This is a reflection of the damage that Brexit has already done. Business in the region is less confident and more reluctant to expand as the future is so uncertain. Current developments of Westminster have compounded this problem. But what can the local authorities do? On both sides of the border, we have a duty of care to the citizens of the border region. Locally elected members in Northern Ireland are currently the only political voice. Uh, border local authorities want to work with both governments to develop proposed creative solutions for border management post-Brexit. We want to be part of the solution, not the problem. Local authorities have an ex excellent track record, have been working on a cross-border basis for over 40 years. It's a long time, but it's also not very long in terms of cross-border cooperation. This despite the political problems at a national level. So in order to assist the rural communities of business, it's essential to address now the structural weaknesses in the border region. This intervention is clearly needed now, and the report Brexit in the Border Corridor highlighted that. The upgrading of infrastructure, both transport and broadband, this would assist in the connectivity in the region, ongoing business support measures to assist business prepare for and deal with the impact. Again, the Irish Government are doing a lot of work with businesses. There's not so much inter-trade Ireland, perhaps in Northern Ireland. We need to focus on the relevant skills levels in the region as well. A Brexit transition programme along the lines possibly of the EU territorial cooperation programme would assist the border region to start to adapt to the challenges of Brexit. It needs to be broad based because every sector will be impacted by Brexit. Continuation of EU programme uh, funds. We are not at a stage where we can do without the intervention. We've moved. We've moved. Um, by a long way, but there's still work that needs to be done. Mitigating risks and or taking opportunities will by necessity mean defending some of what is currently in place, for example the funding streams. But it also means some things will have to change. The border corridor with its peripheral position already lags behind, as I've clearly said. So we need to break past patterns. New policy, new thinking, new methods of cooperation and partnership between local authorities with central government. Very important. We can't do it on our own. It will be essential for border management in the wake of Brexit. The success of any future regime for the management of the border will be judged not only on how well it answers the political, the economic dilemmas caused to the region by Brexit, but also how far it allows the current level of codependence which exists across border areas to continue. In my view, any solution, it must be bottom up, coming from the people, it must be needs based, needs based, and it must be driven and delivered locally. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, uh, Ms. Arthurs. Um, I now call on Councillor Seamus Doyle of the Northern Ireland Local Government Association. And before you start, Councillor, um, we have a time limit here. We're, we're looking to get out of this room by quarter to 11. So if you could make the key points. Um, we have um, two other contributors from, from the witnesses' side, and then members will be asking questions. So if you could get that interaction. So if you could, just limit it to the key points. Yeah, Thanks absolutely. very much, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Chairman. A, uh, first of all, uh, and uh, good morning to our deputies. A, uh, I have to apologise for the President of Nilga, who can't be here. And uh, I'm Councillor Seamus Doyle, a member of Nilga, 
and uh, a member of Armagh, Bonbridge and uh, Craig Avon Borough Council and Bonbridge Council before that after sitting on the main A1, you know. So uh, the, the Northern Ireland Local Government Association, NILGA, is the only functional cross-party politi uh, cross political body in Northern Ireland at the present. Through the Hades and, and Regional Government at Stromit, NILGA has sought to build consensus and represents all of Northern Ireland's main political parties at local government level in Westminster, Dublin and Brussels. Northern Ireland councils have built a strong track record in delivering economic growth and fostering <coughs> peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland and the border corridors in particular will be the regions most affected by Brexit and its outworkings. And we are working intensely to prepare our councils and to uh, attempt to minimise any negative effects on our local areas. Brexit is a major concern for our council. We are all too familiar with the risks we are facing. The unbinding of our close ties with our neighbours on an economic and social level which will widen the gap between our communities and impinge on our way of life. Different rules and regulations creating havoc for business, the environment and ordinary people will create difficult uh, conditions for our small businesses, tourists, resulting in a downturn in our economies. Pressure on our agriculture, health, manufacturing and hospitality sectors. But in this different situation, we will find ourselves and our communities and council, we will find a way to continue our strong tra tradition of cooperation. And we are feeling optimistic about the future of cross-border cooperation, following the recent meetings with regional assemblies in Brussels and follow-up meetings at home. And we are planning further collaborative work together. This will include sharing information and tools to ensure local authorities north and south are prepared for Brexit, embedding uh, uh, entrepreneurs and local authorities, and investigating joint opportunities for training and development, building uh, regional relationships to improve cross-border development and regeneration. In economic policy terms, the emergence of the city and growth deals can be a real game changer for Northern Ireland. Nilgus paper of May 18 highlighted the interconnections for our economies and particular links with the National Development Plan of 2040 and cross-border linkages with dairy and urey areas. Indeed, the dairy region area, 40% of the population lives in Donegal. It goes without saying that investment in our jurisdiction will reap benefits for the entire region, which will be in investment in jobs, broadband, education and infrastructure. This is what we must focus to ensure the growth for the entire island. So thank you very much and if you have any more questions, uh, my colleague Lisa O'Kean will uh, address those. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much, Councillor. Um, I now call on <coughs> Mr Aidan Campbell, um, Policy and the Public Affairs Office of the Rural Community Network. Thanks, um, and thanks to you, Chair, and the members for the invite. Rural Community Network is an NGO, a voluntary and community organisation, with 250 member groups across Northern Ireland, um, and our main areas of interest are rural and community development. Um, so in terms of, of the issues in, in, in terms of the issues that the committee are looking at today, many border communities are on the periphery, both sides of the, of the border, and citizens need to be better connected to opportunity, either locally or in major towns and cities. Many of these communities are still recovering from the legacy of the conflict. Broadband connectivity and a decent road network are a prerequisite to encourage young people to remain in and return to these rural communities. The closure of public services can lead to a vicious circle where young people and young families see no future in those communities, leading to further decline. Government north and south need to put in place policies and programmes that sustain north-south networking and cooperation. Brexit and the absence of a functioning assembly and executive risks regressing into back-to-back -back development, which will further marginalise border communities. The 2014 to 2020 Northern Ireland Rural Development Programme is worth up to £623 million. £70 million in the current programme is allocated to leader. 
The EU Rural Development Programme has been a key policy driver, as well as providing a ring fence funding pot that can only be spent on development of rural communities. As we sit, it's unclear what replaces the Rural Development Programme post-Brexit. The Good Friday Agreement identified the Peace Programme, Interreg and Leader 2, and their successor programmes as areas of potential North-South cooperation. The UK-EU Withdrawal Agreement recognised the need to protect the 90, 1998 Agreement in all its parts. It states both governments will honour their commitments to peace and interreg programmes and the possibility for future support will be examined favourably. But it's concerning to the Rural Community Network and other rural stakeholders that specific reference to later was omitted from the Withdrawal Agreement. The Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has a Brexit Rural Society Working Group and has produced an issues paper. Um, However, in our view, Northern Ireland has barely started discussing what a future policy or programme for rural development post-Brexit will look like. Our concern is that rural development is very far down the agenda amongst the myriad other issues affected by Brexit, and none of this is helped by the absence of a functioning assembly. Despite the problems, um, there are opportunities. Agriculture and rural development are devolved matters, and a functioning assembly could shape any future rural development policy to rural communities and reduce bureaucracy. The Northern Ireland Executive has committed significant match funding from the Northern Ireland Block Grant in previous programme periods, so it won't be a standing start to fund the successor rural development programme. And finally, any new, in our view, any new programmes must complement leader in the border counties and in the Republic of Ireland to enable learning, sharing and cooperation projects to continue. Thanks very much, Eden. Um, I now call on Mr Shane Campbell, Chief Executive, Irish Central Border Area. Thanks very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair, and to the committee for this opportunity to engage with you this morning, and also to Anthony and the Centre for Cross-Border Studies for facilitating this. ICBAN, the Irish Central Border Area Network, we're another local authority-led cross-border partnership. We cover the area known as the Central Border Region, Within that, the eight council areas of Armagh, City, Banbridge, Craigavon, Cavan, Donegal, Fermanagh and Oma, Leitra, Mid Ulster, Monaghan and Sligo. It's a predominantly rural area with few large settlements and small businesses are the backbone to the economy. It's recognised that Brexit represents the greatest challenge to cross-border cooperation since the Troubles. Joint studies between ICBAN and Queen's University have identified uncertainties already impacting on the lives of border citizens and businesses, and that the most important community consideration is protecting the hard-won peace. No one knows what Brexit will yet materialise, but in an understanding that it will create change, the following brief comments are made on supporting and sustaining communities and small businesses in the area post-Brexit. There is a continuing need to ensure free movement of people, goods and services. In the rural community context, this includes access to health and education. Brexit has challenged community cohesion in the area. It is therefore vitally important to prioritise north-south and cross-border cooperation regardless of Brexit outcomes, and in so doing help work against any drift to back-to-back -back development again. For example, in reference to the National Development Plan and the planning framework, and in the absence of a regional development strategy review in Northern Ireland, cognizance should be taken of the fact that through local development plans, Northern Ireland councils are reaching out to their neighbours. Connectivity infrastructure is critical to enabling an access to rural services. This includes both digital communications and roads-based transportation. Delivering on the National Broadband Plan ambitions is absolutely critical for rural border communities. Um, and as active commentators on the subject, we'd encourage that if the National Broadband Plan cannot be advanced further to delivery in its current format, that an alternative solution must be found. Strategic road corridors are vital for transportation, access and movement. Therefore, be vital and helpful if both governments formally recommitted to the long-planned delivery of the A5N2 Dublin to Derry Jewellin project. And the importance of the A4N16 Sligo to Balagoli and Belfast route is important for east-west navigation and needs support and highlighting from both governments. There are many successful examples where government has helped spur on a renewed regional economy. The centre border region would benefit from such bespoke interventions to complement the local leadership and initiatives being taken there. And while national government's attention is focused on Brexit, the delivery of local services must continue to be a priority. Local authorities from both sides of the border must be supported to engage together through community planning with its focus on the social and economic elements of well-being. 
Continued direct interventions into promoting cooperation are needed to the delivery of the peace interreg and leader funds in arrangements between EU and UK. And in the absence of these, ensuring that they're directly replaced. These supports have been vital for communities and businesses of the region. There, these should include a provision for softer people-to-people -people and community-based initiatives also to help maintain good relations, alongside infrastructure supports, of course. And also then support for the revitalisation of border towns and villages, which have been in persistent decline. Finally, government, telecoms providers and the regulator must ensure that inadvertent roaming charges will not be reintroduced to disenfranchise border region communities as a consequence of the UK planning to leave the single digital market. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr Campbell. Um, I made reference to it earlier on. <clears throat> the witnesses here will be given an information uh, session in the AV room at 11 o'clock, so it's our aim to get out of here before, before that point. So I'd just call on members, and as they've indicated, um, Declan Brannock, Deputy Declan, Declan Brannock, please. Um, uh, Thanks for your indulgence and thanks to the members for their indulgence. Uh, I'm not a member of the committee and normally procedure would take that others would speak and uh, unfortunately I have another meeting at half ten but hope to meet you in the AV room later. Firstly I want to uh, welcome uh, the delegation uh, and start by paying I suppose tribute to uh, the both local councillors right across the border region, indeed the management of, of local authorities uh, and, and the managers of the programmes that have been presented here this morning in terms of their efforts. Um, I, I smiled when I heard Pamela make reference to the interreg programme starting in 1990. I remember an MEP talking about it um, in a very strange accent uh, in the Leinster region and we thought he was talking about Easter egg. Uh, and that was in the late 80s that this programme was coming and the great benefits that it would be to the border region. And there's absolutely no doubt uh, the impact of both Interreg and Peace and uh, uh, as an additionality to what the local authorities have been doing has, has been enormous. Um, I have to say, uh, as a member of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, we've been looking at having you back in again uh, in relation to this issue because... Uh, the question I want to, I suppose, specifically ask is that it is clear that whether it's the North West who are not here today uh, or yourselves, that everybody is making a concerted effort and has made sure that the monies that have been available uh, in that additionality to, to the border region are best spent. And I, for one, as a former member of the East Border Region and indeed as a local public representative for 25 years, uh, would say that... Uh, that additionality in, in rural border regions and particularly uh, in, in my own area of Loud that I can speak for specifically, I'm sure the members will speak for their own area, has been hugely beneficial to both peace, indeed uh, prosperity and that sense of cooperation. I keep using the phrase that uh, despite the fact that uh, management were all the time engaging uh, through the troubles uh, too many people, including councillors, had their backs to each other. And that has changed dramatically, certainly in my lifetime, uh, both from EU intervention and, of course, obviously the additionality of the peace monies. But we're in a huge vacuum currently. And Mike, I'm coming to my question, and, and I was wanting to, you know, what, what can be done collectively to ensure that in the context of Brexit, that, you know, that duty of care, the bottom updated approach, you know, new policies, new thinking, you know, with government to ensure that in a more extreme situation almost than we've ever found ourselves in, to make sure that there is a, a specific program, and I, I, I know that Anthony mentioned 15%, uh, the, the reality is that on, when you're in a vacuum, you can't plan We've been told that the programme will be available up until 2020, or some of the programmes will be available until 2020. We had, um, and I'll finish, Chair, when I say this, we, we've had, um, um, for example, Gina McIntyre in here talking uh, about the programmes and extra territorial programmes and programmes that are available for between non-EU countries and EU countries, and that there are exemplars of those across Europe. What is needed, as, and I'm asking, is, it, is this the case that there's action needed in terms of actually getting somebody within the EU programmes who, by the way, what was happening 
in each of these particular bodies down the years was lauded, and I think this is the most important point I want to make this morning, was lauded in Europe by the EU Commission, by the then EU Commissioner at the time, uh, Maura Gagan Quinn, uh, and indeed Colin Wolfe, as what was happening in the border region in Loud, or not in Loud, but uh, specifically, but in the region generally, was unique in Europe. I think they talked about 130 uh, cross territorial regions where this type of cooperation was not happening, but was happening in our region. And our region has benefited hugely from it. And I'm, I'm just going to leave the thought process, and I'll meet you later. Uh, I have another meeting just as to what can be done by the politicians. Uh, and that's what we are to ensure that either a new program or an enhanced program delivers from Carlingford Loch to uh, the tip of uh, Donegal uh, to ensure that the region continues to prosper because it is going to take a backward step if Brexit uh, happens. And I suppose that's the key question. If, uh, money speaks languages, but the communities who have badly suffered and continue to suffer, and uh, again I'll conclude by saying it's incredible, despite the fact that the money that came in through interreg and peace, that it still hasn't filtered down into communities, not just in the border region, but in, indeed in, in, in the more depraved areas, whether it's in Belfast or Derry. Thank and how can so we ensure Deputy. that? Thanks, Thanks, Deputy. Thanks Deputy. A point very well made. I'm going to take uh, Deputy Neve Smith now as well, so we'll come back to the witnesses then. Uh, okay. when you conclude. Thank Thanks very, very much. much. Um, to the delegation, thank you very much and you're very welcome. And to the councillors, and specifically I hope you don't mind if I mention Councillor Aidan Campbell, who's from the same constituency as myself. Uh, delighted to have you all here this morning. And of course, it's, I suppose, uh, a milestone day for us nationally, Euro Euro as, a, as a European country too. And of course, you, you couldn't be here on a more appropriate day, let's say, in terms of keeping the border region firmly on the agenda. Um, I, as somebody who's from Cavan and Monaghan, see every day the uh, influence and the very positive influence you've had in terms of peace funding and interreg funding and cross-border co uh, cooperation and what the, the difference that that has made to towns like Castle Blaney, like Clonus, like Bell Turbot, like Ballyconnell, that, you know, really were uh, war-torn uh, towns and villages where everybody wanted to leave and nobody, w people were afraid to live. And thankfully we have, um, you know, the, the next generation of young people won't Ever remember that, please God, uh, in terms of the future. However, that said, um, I would be concerned from what the presentations you have made here today that there is uh, a real risk and a real risk of all of that uh, unravelling. You have all mentioned on numerous occasions in your presentations the um, non um, working of the Assembly instalment. We have Brexit looming largely. We have our own government here very much focused on that. That's what, what they have to do on the Brexit issue. Uh, so where does that leave the border region? Completely in a, in a vacuum. And where does that leave your own organisations? Who is flying the flag for you? And I think you're absolutely right to be here today to be flying the flag for a very focused, coordinated um, task force almost that you know encompasses everything that you're doing with a huge focus on the border region on both sides of the border. The borders Cavan, Monaghan, Mead, Sligo, Tyrone, Armagh, Fermanagh. Uh, there needs to actually be you know very fast action because there is a real risk from what's happening today, what's been happening over since 2016, of all that good work unraveling. Uh, and we don't want to go back to times like where towns and villages um, have almost been ghost towns and villages, which they were 20 years. Years ago. So I'm glad to have you here this morning making the case for that, that there is almost a, a task force, there is a certain urgency put in place by our own government and it has to come from here, I, I really believe, because you know the government has a job to do in terms of flying the flag for the country uh, in the European uh, side of things, but there has to be a real focus and you're very, it's very true to say that the A5, uh, the M3 motorway, which currently stops at, at Mead, we need to be looking at all that type of infrastructure. It's I, I think our last uh, regional rural affairs meeting where we had uh, Aaron Mulderen in, where we talked about the fact we have no rail line. You know, in this day and age, and there seems to be a continual focus, as I always say, from the Dublin Galway line south of that. And you know, 
we're almost the forgotten uh, part, half of the country, and we are half of the country. And we certainly have to bring that focus and attention back to that whole area and to the absolute need for the infrastructure that you've talked about here this morning, the roads, the rail, the broadband, all of that. That is certainly going to do, as you said, Pamela, ensure the connectivity uh, is there, that the relationship stays strong. Um, and I suppose, again, to follow on what my colleague has suggested here this morning, um, we have a lot in, in the presentations that you've made, but in terms of tangible measures that you would like to see us as a committee do bring forward that will benefit all of what you're doing and make sure that you're on top of the agenda nationally for the border region. Thank you. Thanks very much, Deputy. Um, I now ask um, say, Dr. Suarez, maybe you, you take on a few of those points. Um, maybe someone else would as well um, and come back. Just conscious of time, yeah. is it? Thank you, Chair, and thanks for those questions. Um, uh, uh, perhaps in terms of what can be done collectively to ensure that there is a specific program in the post-Brexit context that will actually address the needs of communities in the border region and the specific needs of the border region, I think, and but linking on to what can this committee do and what can the government do, what can departments do, I think Pamela actually alluded to it and other uh, uh, speakers have alluded to it, other witnesses, it's listening to the people of the border region, the actual communities that live, work and breathe the border region. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you w one very specific example, and I can actually use this as an opportunity to, to plug this particular project, which is not EU funded. Uh, it's actually got alternative funding, uh, Joseph Ranty Charitable Trust, the Community Relations Council in Northern Ireland, and mo most recently, and we're very grateful to the Reconciliation Funds of the Department for Foreign Affairs and Trade, which is the Towards a New Common Chapter project, which is working with community groups from both sides of the border, and they have come up with their vision, of what they want for cooperation, how do we go about cooperating, what are the kinds of issues they would like to see addressed in terms of cooperation, and they're about to link up now with community groups in Scotland, England and Wales, because they also are conscious not just of the north-south element, but the east-west element, and that would actually fit in with the Good Friday Agreement, which has all, if we are to respect all parts of the Good Friday Agreement in terms of Brexit, which both the EU and the UK government said they are going to protect, then it's not just about the institutions in Northern Ireland, it's also about the relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, but also between the island of Ireland as a whole and Great Britain. Uh, so they, ha they have that. And perhaps you might want to invite uh, those members of those community groups to come and present their draft common chapter to this, to this committee. That might help. But I, I would just like to add, in terms of the 15% that I mentioned, the Centre for Cross-Border Studies, in two consultation responses to the, to the current peace and interreg programmes, and in specific reference to peace, we noted the need to ring-fence at least 15% of that fund for cross-border cooperation, because we were afraid that because that particular programme, peace, has a derogation, although it's in a European territorial cooperation programme, it has a derogation allowing projects funded from that to be in just the one jurisdiction. And we were afraid then that perhaps, for, obviously for, for very good reasons, that uh, uh, lots of those funds would then just be set, spent in the, uh, the one jurisdiction and not uh, support cross-border cooperation. So we're, we're very concerned that in terms of this future Peace Plus programme, that we have ring fencing. So for, for the, 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 the part of that future Peace Plus programme that is the continuation of the current Peace programme, that there is ring fencing for that budget, but also in terms of the interreg element, interreg is truly cross-border. And we, unfortunately, we're talking about a future Peace Plus programme where the interreg element will have lost part of what it currently contains, which is a connection to Scotland, between Scotland, Northern Ireland, and the border counties of Ireland, and one interreg programme, and the other one, Wales and Ireland, we're losing that, uh, or it seems we're going to lose that. And obviously, Aidan and others are referred to the loss or, or the, the lack of d definition around where, where does leader fit into to the future of this. So it's, it's, in terms of what committee members can do here, it's promote the voices of people in the region, support them in what they're trying to do in terms of, of, of their vision for cooperation, but also paying 
and helping us in paying uh, close attention to what is coming out in terms of this future Peace Plus program. And obviously, Pamela also alluded to this, we'll also be keep, keeping close attention to the UK government's proposed UK Shared Prosperity Fund and the fact that that, as a replacement for EU structural funds, seems to be ignoring the fact that structural funds actually funds cross-border cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Suarez, I, I call on uh, Ms. Andrews, please. Okay. Yes, Chairman, I think if we're actually going to be serious about, you know, assisting the border, you know, we have to do a bit more. It has to be much more strategic and it has to be the Irish government in conjunction, at the highest levels, in conjunction with in Northern Ireland, I suppose it's question mark, but even with officials at the minute, maybe it's working with the Secretary of State. Um, you know, to say, look, we need to be um, strategic, we need really to focus on the border area. If you look at the interreg programmes, and indeed the peace, the peace Plus that is proposed, it's £250 million in total. It's, it's nothing, really, for the needs that are still there. So it's looking at a strategic intervention. Um, if you take the EU funding out of cross-border activity, no one funds it. There is a small amount of money from uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs here. And that is it. It has never really been taken seriously. We've always been working against the tide in terms of cross-border cooperation. Yes, uh, we've been lauded across Europe, as, as uh, the, the, the TD says, but basically we haven't been lauded at home. And still the border corridor lags behind. The facts are there. The people have been leaving. Our young people have been leaving. This is perhaps an opportunity to properly focus, to take a strategic approach, to look across at the needs. We've done something a little bit similar in the past. This isn't a new thing, really, in terms of the first two interreg programmes were centralised. All the decisions were made in Dublin and Belfast. So, basically... People here were deciding what our needs were. As I say, it's a bottom-up approach. So it's looking at what the requirements is. For the Interreg 3 programme, all our members said, we want to make decisions. We did that at local level. Um, we set up an action team, but it was Dublin. It was Belfast. We then obviously had a government um, from our, our uh, two uh, finance ministers in Belfast and Dublin and relevant people along the border who could speak for the border. The elected members there have a mandate, and they've the only mandate in Northern Ireland at the minute. So it's not reinventing the wheel. It can be done, but it needs at the highest levels governments to say, yes, we've recognised there's all the talk about the border, but the, the, the worry we have is that, you know, it's sorted, whatever way it's sorted, and then we're left to fend for ourselves. So there is something that can be done. It's tangible, it'll make a difference, but it needs to start now because the businesses, and particularly on this side of the border, have so, so many have closed, the small, the micro, the mushroom industry, for example, just to give one. They're going now, but we need to look at this, and there's no point in not doing it on a cross-border basis because cross-border is not easy, but it makes sense. Thanks very much, Ms. Arthur. I'm just going to give um, Shane Campbell a short intervention. I'm going to go back to the, to the, to the members then, OK? Thank you. <clears throat> yes, the, the border region is probably going to be that area most affected in the EU as a result of Brexit. Whatever may happen, we see change happening, and we know there's further challenge, or we anticipate further challenges along the way. But we have to add that to the fact that the border region had pre-existing issues before Brexit, and they're still not being addressed. Pamela's absolutely right. Uh, Deputy Smith's absolutely right in what you're saying. And Deputy Brachna, there is a need for a high-level intervention into the cross-border region. Interreg, peace, leader have all been very important. We don't want to see the end of those. But they've been sticky plaster solutions onto an area and an issue which is huge. It needs that sustainable prosperity plan once and for all. We didn't get that after the 1998 agreement. We didn't see that direct delivery after peace. We haven't built on that, and therefore the challenges still remain. There is a need for a task force, yes. But when we ask government for that, government says to us, ah, but we need to see local leadership. It has to be self-help. It has to be bottom-up. We're evidence of the fact that that is happening. Our seminar later will detail the projects that we are doing. We are taking the local initiatives. We are doing what we can. The National Development Plan prioritises support for the North West. 
It also prioritises support on the east border area. Brilliant. It's good to see those happening in the border region. But for those of us, and a little pitch here, personally, in the central border region, it does not feature to the same extent in the national plans. And there has to be a resolution to that. Thank you. Now I call on Deputy Kenny and followed by Deputy Penrose. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you for all of you for your, your contributions this morning. Uh, I'm very conscious of the work, particularly of ICBAN, in my own region in Leitrim and cross-border work that has gone on there for many years, and the huge impact it's had, and the positive it has been for many, many communities, and for various sectors, the local authorities, the, the health services, all of those things have benefited. But really, and I, and I think about this in, in the context of, of the border region that I, I know so, so well, and if I go around from Pettigo, which again, in that town you'll see nearly half the places is boarded up, right the way around to Kilty Clawher to places like Swadland Bar. You know, if you drive through Swadland Bar this morning, there's not much in it. And it's the same if you go the other side and go to Kinali. There's not much there either. And the reality of it is, and I'm conscious that the border was drawn on county boundaries, and county boundaries in a lot of cases was just a ditch somewhere or, or a drain. It wasn't like a natural border between two countries like you had between France and Germany where you had a massive river or where you had a range of mountains somewhere. So it's a very unnatural border. The natural thing to happen is that it's all the one. And because of that, it has had a particular impact on the communities that live there. And the, the, the real problem we have here is we have a sense of stagnation. And Brexit has, has deepened that. Stagnation has been there in many parts of rural Ireland on both sides of the border for many years, but particularly in the border region. People who want to take risk and who want to go forward and have an idea and want to bring it, bring it forward, at the moment, and certainly for the past number of years, they won't get support for it from the traditional places to go to the banks or go to wherever they want to get finance for it. It's not happening. Government, because of Brexit, has backed away considerably, and they come to, to people like yourselves, and whatever help you can give, again, has been smothered by Brexit. That's the reality. And really, what we have to try and, 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 and overcome here is, is that sense of stagnation. So how do we move that forward? How do we change that? How do we change that mindset? Uh, and, and really, the, the, the essence of it all is that the funding that has come down the years, which has been very welcome and has made a huge difference, has never been enough. You know, it has always been, and I take Shane's point of a sticky plaster, it has always been just enough to manage, just enough to, you know, every couple of months there was some project rolled out and this looks good, and somewhere else looks good. But for to actually make a seismic shift to change gear, it would take big investment and big ideas and, 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 a, and a total change as to where we're, where we're at. And I don't think that we're going to be in a position until this Brexit is sorted out to resolve that. And that's just, that's just the reality. And I'm not trying to, you know, I, I, like, let's be honest here, you know, Brexit has just totally destroyed what was the potential that was there. And I think, you know, governments on, on you know, and I know that the Assembly in the North not operating is certainly a huge problem. There's no, no point in denying that or, or hiding away from that. It is a huge problem, which has to be sorted out. However, both governments, if you like, who are guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement, and all of this flows from the Good Friday Agreement, have a responsibility for to do what it takes to make that seismic shift, to ch change, change gear. And in the context of Brexit, you know, it, it really sharpens the, 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 the mindset, it sharpens the focus as to where the problems are and what needs to be done. And I, I'm certainly of the view that unless there is um, some plan and it has to be a plan that, has, that is budgeted very clearly over a short period of time, that we're not talking about 40 years away, that we're talking about over five years, A, B, C, what's going to happen for to get these communities, the people, four out of five young people in places like Swadland Bar and Kinali on both sides of the border had to emigrate for the last 50 years. That's, that, was their, that was the answer to their problems. And that's still the answer to their problems today unless we change things. So I, I, first of all, I just want to welcome you all here today. I know you're having the presentation later on. I, I don't have any questions, really, to be honest with you. But I, I just think it's important on the day that's in it and what's happening internationally, you know, that we're here and that we are looking at the part of, of, of the world that will be most impacted by Brexit and the communities will be most impacted by them. And I think we need to send out a strong, a strong message from here that both governments need to step up to the mark 
and, and, and come up with solutions for this rather than, and I'm guilty of it myself, you know, we're, we're all talking about the problem. Finding the solutions is difficult, but we have to engage to make that happen. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much, Deputy. Deputy William Penn. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Sorry, I was a bit late. Another meeting. But uh, certainly the uncertainty associated with Brexit uh, and indeed in light of the non-operation of the government in Northern Ireland is certain are, are two significant issues that, that you've uh, highlighted and crystallised for us here this morning. And you've certainly given a wake-up call as to the real impact of Brexit. Uh, but Deputy Kenny is right, until that matter is, is finalised and crystallised, everybody's in a bit of a vacuum and you're, you're, you're hazarding around and the, the, well, the governments are going to be focused upon resolution associated with that. And until you get a resolution, uh, everything else stands still. And of course, you know, the whole thing is, there has been a, a severe, we have a lost decade as well in terms of economic uh, the, 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 the downturn that affected this island and, and, and indeed across the, the world, but especially within this island. Um, and in, in that context, I, I, was, I, was, I, mean, I was aware of the impact of the interreg funding that has had in the region. I come from the Midlands, but only up the road, less than an hour, I'd be across in, into a lot of the towns that you referred to this morning. Um, but um, I, I'm well, one of your contributors made the point about uh, I, I was struck by the fact that the leader funded may well be falling between the cracks, uh, and that's that's something that certainly has to be highlighted and grasped. And the necessity then, in terms of the need to ring fence funds to be made available, and a minimum minimum, minimum amount be made available for cross-border projects, is something that I, I'm, I, I, as an agricultural spokesperson, was particularly. Uh, involved in, in, in relation to the very two years ago when the when Brexit vote came in, the, the immediate impact that that had upon some of the agriculture industries you mentioned, the mushroom industry, almost uh, significant. Uh, uh, you know, and the, some of the some of the farmers involved were almost wiped up. And said Deputy Kenny was involved with a number of those uh, in, in in that regard, and the impact that that had because we. we, we have a huge export base there in terms of mushrooms. And indeed, if you looked in further down the feed, one of the areas that we were very worried about was cheddar cheese and stuff like that. So, I mean, and we have a huge lot of that going across cross border and Eklund and everything else, and we had to drink that. But coming from a very rural place myself, uh, I think what you have resonated with me, the most impact of me this morning is about the impact of a rural depopulation and decline. Uh, that this this is uh, endemic and almost an epidemic across the, across the island. Uh, and could you outline? Have you any specific measures that you feel are required to, to, to deal with this, uh, you know, rampant decline in small towns and villages and communities across the border region? But as I said, it's symptomatic of what's occurring across the island. And you know you have a challenge of outward migration. People gravitate to the towns, where the, and and of course it's, it all becomes self-fulfilling because the big industries and let it be whatever shape or whatever, let it be the pharmaceutical or healthcare or whatever, they all go to the village. and they gravitate to where there's actually colleges of education and 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 uh, ITs and great, it's great uh, to those towns and then Ferris and Dock has done well with that. And that's a tremendous achievement there, uh, and uh, but. Nevertheless, that, 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 and that's wonderful, but, but the, the challenge is, uh, the, 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 and in the context of, pros, pros, of the threats posed by Brexit, could you outline any targeted or specific policy measures or resources or funds that are required to stem the tide? I think that would be important because uh, areas are nothing without their people, and the people won't be there unless there's something we, we provide gainful employment for them in, in those areas as close as possible. Now, you cannot have uh, you know, you can't have an industry in every town, or it's like people arguing having a small hospital in every town. That, that's a nonsensical approach. Uh, but I suppose uh, you made the point in terms of, um, uh, you know, co connectivity and, and the broadband and various things, which allows people to actually operate small businesses from within, their, within not just within a small town, and within a house in a town, and which could actually create two or three jobs. And those jobs may be small in number. But they're actually critical to survival of, uh, and sustainability of rural communities. Thanks very much, Deputy Penrose. And, and Deputy Penrose has, has a specific question in relation to the specific measures that, that are required to halt the decline in small rural towns and villages. Um, I, I um, see Miss um, O'Kane has indicated she's going to come in, and I give all the witnesses 
an opportunity to give a contribution and maybe sum up because we're, we're approaching the end of the meeting. So um, I'll call on Ms O'Kane first, please. Yes, I'm conscious of time, Chair. I mean, we've heard today and we hear everywhere we go about the, the real desire to maintain cross-border collaboration. We now need the full commitment from the governments and from the EU. There is a history, there is a tradition, there is a spirit of, of cooperation. But as it's been mentioned before, it has been a sticking plaster approach. And it's been, in the main, funding driven. Not always, but in the main. And I think what we're starting to see with the emergence of city deals in most of the councils in Northern Ireland and the very clear cross-border links with the regional spatial economic strategies that the regional assemblies are driving, that there, somebody needs to take a step back and say, look, if we work together on this at this level and put the funding from both governments in on, on both sides of the border, that really there could be better complementarity. Um, that would address many of the infrastructural issues that have been raised by Aidan and, and some of the TDs here this morning. I mean, our economic hinterlands do extend across the border for all of the councils in Northern Ireland, and we all have shared objectives around economic growth. So I think there needs to be something at that level, and the co cooperation needs to be mainstreamed, as has been referred to by some of my colleagues. It can't just be piecemeal. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'll come um, back to Aidan, please. Just a couple of quick points, because I know we're, we're running out of time. I um, agree with a lot of the points deputies have made here this morning. Um, um, in terms of rural depopulation and this idea of you know, what, what are the, the specific um, things we need to do, I just look, to me it's about, and Deputy Penrose mentioned it himself, about um, this idea of connectivity. I think an investment in road infrastructure and broadband and, in, and putting in that connectivity that businesses can develop and can thrive. I can think of you know, a road that was dueled very close to me from the end of Dungan, the, the M1, which previously stopped in Dungan, was dueled to ba the Balagali roundabout. It's about 20 miles of dual carriageway. If you look at all the villages and businesses within about 15 mile radius of that road over the last 15 or 20 years, the population of those villages have gone up because now those villages are much more attractive in terms of people commuting to jobs um, in Portadown, in Craigavon, in the city. Um, so opening, people, opening up um, rural communities to that um, opportunity uh, to, to, to connect. Um, the businesses in those areas have grown. Um, so for me, that idea of promoting connectivity and investing in connectivity is hugely important. And one specific thing I think this committee could do in, rela in relation to uh, the point I brought up earlier um, about leader and plans for leader is to write to our department, officials in our department, we don't have uh, an equivalent committee at the minute in the north, um, or even to DEFRA in Westminster, to ask about what their future plans for a rural development programme is. Obviously, as a neighbouring jurisdiction, you have a, 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 an interest in terms of developing cooperation. Your own rural development programme will be going through change as the common agriculture policy changes. Um, and I think that could be one practical step um, in terms of asking them, you know, what is their plan for rural development um, post-Brexit? Thanks very much. Interesting point. Um, Ms. Hartress, please. Yeah, well, I think really what we need to do is to take a, a cross-sectoral approach you know, the, the Brexit is affecting every sector. And if we're being serious about the border, maybe for the government to look at the 11 local authorities along the border, so that they have the political mandate to come up with their priorities, take a strategic approach, come up with their priorities um, of what is the... Uh, is required. What is the interventions that are required along the border? And I suppose one key thing just to say as well, if you look at the town of Newry, um, First Derivative is a major company there, at, at, at 1,000 employees in Newry, but that was a local indigenous businessman that had faith in the border. He could have taken that business anywhere, and indeed they have offices across the world. But you have those local people who are prepared to invest in the local community. And I think there's something there that could be done along the border in the government recognising the work. That first derivatives haven't received any funding from anywhere. I suppose in his case he didn't need it. But there might be other individuals along the border, entrepreneurs, who would stay in the region if there was some kind of an incentive. So that's just my thought. But I think we have to be serious about this. Looking at one sector or, you know, bits and pieces, this piecemeal approach hasn't worked. 
And again, the local authorities are there. They're ready to step up to the mark to say this is what we require. There will be competing interests. It's the same everywhere. But again, I think we're big enough to look and to see where are the priorities. Where is Shane outlines? You know, the central border area. Yes, in terms of connectivity, whatever uh, we have better in the east. There are different requirements. We will compete with each other. But at the end of the day, I think the common view is the same. And it's back to what we said earlier: promoting cross-border economic uh, development. It benefits the people of the border region and hopefully keeps our young people there. But we're not going to do it if we just stay, stay with a sticky plaster. It's not going to work. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pamela. Sure. Yep. Final comment. I would have to say I would probably, you know, I, I value what you said, uh, Councillor Seamus Doyle, which is, you know, reflective of what you all said here today. I think there's pre-existing issues that haven't been addressed. So Brexit or no Brexit, we obviously haven't really been addressing this in a strategic way. So regardless of what happens, I think you've outlined today that there is an, a pre-existing problem that we need to recognise and deal with. Thanks, Deputy. Um, now I'm just going to call on uh, Shane Campbell and Dr Anthony Suarez to, to conclude. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, Chair, in, in brief, uh, the question of how do you give someone in Swanland Bar the same opportunity as someone in Dublin? It's about giving them the tools. It's about giving them the opportunities. Broadband is absolutely critical. How that could open up rural life. The, the delivery of the national broadband plan has to be key and has to be critical. We can't afford to sit on it again now for another six years. Otherwise, Ireland loses its place. It's the same north of the border and the opportunities there for the delivery of those schemes. Um, it's not too late, I would suggest, to be able to look at something between Northern Ireland and the Republic. If the MBP cannot be delivered and cannot be advanced, there has to be some new solution found to giving people the opportunities, because that's where the future is going. If you look at where the 21st century is taking us, it's into new areas of technology and creativity. And it's things that people can actually do on a small device, and they need the means and the opportunity to, to be able to deliver on that. I would just finally advocate what my colleagues have said, and that is... Uh, a strategic support for the border region. That has to come from government. And if this committee could use its influence to help promote that, um, well, what we're providing is the local leadership, and that has to be key in the delivery of that. As Pamela has detailed, uh, and as Aidan here represents, uh, and, and Nilga, and ourselves, myself and Anthony, we are a consortium of cross-border interests of local authorities and communities. And they're passionate about their areas. We all are, and we want to do something for those areas. We're not asking for government to do everything. But we're saying to government, help here. Uh, give us a leg up, and we'll certainly do our bit. Thank you. And Dr. Anthony? Yeah, uh, on that point, uh, in my uh, written submission, I did refer to work that some of the organisations here and Intertrade Ireland and others did back in 2014, where we published a draft solidarity charter for the economic revitalisation of the Irish border development corridor. A, a lot of this work was already done, and it does need a strategic look, uh, uh, look at this uh, in terms of the border region. And it's not just about the negatives. It's the potentials that are there and the potentials can only really be grasped if you give people the tools and there is connectivity, not just in terms of transport or infrastructure, but also connectivity between uh, policy makers on the two sides of the border. And I go back to what uh, Deputy Kenny said, it's also, this is the time where the UK government needs to set up to the plate as the co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement because we don't have an assembly, we do not have an executive. There are local authorities in Northern Ireland and the, the cross-border networks, local authority-led cross-border networks here are evidence that there's a willingness there to engage with opportunities presented by policy being developed uh, 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 on, on the other side of the border but the tools have to be given, the freedom has to be given. So at the moment, in, without an executive, without an assembly, it's the UK government that has to step up to the mark as co-guarantor and co-guarantor of Strand 2, the Good Friday Agreement, as well as Strands 1 and 3. Thank you. OK, thanks a lot. T Deputy Martin Kenny, please. Yeah, just briefly to, to, to say that the, the, the issue, I think, in regard to this is that we have to be coming at it at scale. But that's been the problem in the past. It's all been bitty. And, uh, you know, I, I often think... We, it's, it's almost like R&D is a sort of the research and development is the buzzword nowadays. And we have an awful lot of research on, and the likes of yourselves and many organisations go out there and come up with um, 
methods to, to resolve issues and to sort stuff out. But it, it almost needs to be commercialised. You need someone to take it on to drive this forward. And to do that, they need to have deep pockets or they need to have access to resources. And that's the problem. That we have, we have, the ideas, the solutions to much of this stuff exists. But bringing, the, bringing those solutions to a level where they actually have impact is the problem. And, and that's the piece that's missing. And Brexit, if you like, has sharpened the focus in on that. But on the other side of it, perhaps Brexit has created the opportunity for us to actually see it for what it is, rather than to be, you know, mundling along the way we were. Now we know what the problem is. And I, I think really what we need to be coming at here is coming at some kind of a, of a, of a plan, working with yourselves, for to say, look, two governments, we've met the people on the ground in the border region and we understand what their problems are, and there are solutions there, and they need resources to resolve them. And both governments have the opportunity now for to, to move this to a different place. But I, I, I think the leadership that's provided by the local authorities, particularly through yourselves, is going to be vital to making all of that happen. Thanks very much, Deputy Kenny. Um, no, I'd just like to thank, on behalf of the committee, um, all the witnesses for your contribution. I think it's a very worthwhile engagement. Um, and we, we will engage with you further into the future. And there's some very good questions posed and asked and requested. So we, we, we're going to take those issues up. Um, I propose that the Joint Committee meeting is now adjourned Sinday. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed.